You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 29, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, update on HIV. Our presenter is Dr. Andrew DiNardo. He's an assistant professor of medicine and infectious disease at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. For those of you who um, were here last year, uh, I had a chance to, this is my second year in a row, so um, some of you, there'll be a significant overlap, but I updated the slides um, with uh, some new things in the field. Um, so my name's Andrew DiNardo. I'm an internal medicine and infectious disease trained physician. I uh, uh, work around three to four months a year in Eswatini, Swaziland, doing tuberculosis, helminth, HIV, uh, immunology, and then I see patients here in our inpatient consult service and in our outpatient uh, HIV clinic. Um, so I, I have a bit of a varied life. Um, uh, I have absolutely nothing to disclose, no, um, <laughs> no pharmaceutical money coming in for, for my work. Uh, here's the learning objectives. Um, so we're going to go over the importance of understanding the HIV cascade of care, and I'm really just going to emphasize over and over the importance of uh, early diagnosis, uh, opt-out testing, uh, linking people into care, um, because the meds work really well. But if people don't know they're diagnosed or if they don't stay in care, obviously the, the meds don't have a chance to work. So. Uh, important thing is getting getting them linked to care. We'll go over some cases about uh, drug drug interactions, but uh, like everything with HIV care, uh, that's getting a lot easier um, as as we get newer and better medicines. Um, we'll go over who should be tested um, and who should be on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, the the very easy answer for that is absolutely everybody. We'll go over some common immune mediated adverse effects from HIV and antiretrovirals. Uh, we'll go over some uh, safety of vaccines uh, uh, in HIV as well. So these are two landmark studies. It's the same study, but the, it was updated. So originally came out in 2011 and then uh, updated in 2016. And these were studies on serodiscordant couples. So um, these were studies in which one partner had HIV and the other partner didn't. And what they were doing was studying um, if early antiretroviral therapy uh, will decrease transmission. And, and that's what they found. And it really is a landmark study because um, uh, what it has shown, and other studies have confirmed this, is if an individual is undetectable, they don't transmit. So the, the easy way to relay that to patients is U equals U. If you're undetectable, you don't transmit. So we tell that to people. Um, and in fact, many countries' guidelines do not recommend barrier protection if you are in a monogamous relationship uh, and you are, you are undetectable. Now, obviously, there are other uh, STIs that people can get, so you have to um, think about that and be careful uh, in that aspect. But um, this is a, an important public health message. All right, so who's virally suppressed? So uh, a typical HIV clinic in the United States, we have anywhere from 80 to 95% of our patients virally suppressed. So is that good enough? Um, and unfortunately, the answer is no, it's not good enough. And, and this allows me to introduce the cascade of care. And when you think of the cascade of care, if you can think of the 80-20 rule, uh, in general, um, as we go through each step in the cascade, we're losing 20% of individuals. So unfortunately, of those who are HIV infected, only 80% know that they're infected. Only 80% have been diagnosed. Unfortunately, there's another 20% loss approximately as we go to those who are actually linked into a clinic. Again, approximately 20% loss in terms of those who are retained in clinic. Um, and now there's less of a loss. So this slide is pretty old, um, but of those who are retained in clinic, 
Uh, in the United States, almost all of them are on antiretroviral therapy, and if they're taking their medicine, they're going to be suppressed. One message that you guys should walk away with this talk is that the medications work very well. So the biggest thing that we have to do is work with patients to get the medicines in their mouth, and that usually deals um, barriers then are just uh, individual life barriers, mental health barriers, substance use barriers. But if we can get the medicine into people, um, it works and they, they get suppressed. So these are old numbers from Houston. Um, in the bottom you can see uh, an updated number, but the Houston numbers uh, mirror what we had nationally um, uh, at this point six years ago. And, and these numbers are getting better for those who are suppressed. They're not getting better uh, in terms of what is on the left of the cascade of care. So we still, uh, while we're getting much higher rates of people on therapy and getting them suppressed, we're still struggling getting people in to care uh, and getting everybody who has an infection diagnosed with their infection. So from a public health aspect, the big gains that we need to make are moving into increased diagnosis, uh, getting people linked to care, and getting them retained in care. So I, I mentioned that I work in Eswatini a good chunk of my time, um, and there are additional barriers to care there, uh, as this, this paper here shows. So in addition to just the individual barriers, unfortunately there are some family barriers. Uh, that add on to who can actually get into care. So, uh, for example, not every partner is able to go to a clinic if the, um, uh, if the husband refuses their ability to do so or if the husband forbids them to actually use antiretroviral therapy. So a uh, large amount of social stigma that still is preventing people from taking their medications. This um, slide at the far right of this one, you can see uh, an additional thing that is uh, a barrier is a, a lack of universal HIV viral load testing and genotyping. So now we're getting much more people on therapy. Um, Eswatini, Swaziland, proudly will probably be one of the first countries to meet the 90-90-90 goals, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, which is getting 90% of people diagnosed, 90% on treatment, and 90% virally suppressed. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, a barrier in the laboratory side, we're not getting the viral load testing as much as we want, we're not getting genotyping as much as we want, and therefore when we get genotyping, we're identifying genotypic resistance much later than we would like, and therefore there's many more mutations uh, that we have to deal with that, than we would like to deal with. So this is 90-90-90. This is the WHO goals that we're trying to get for every community. Get 90% of all HIV-infected individuals diagnosed, get 90% of them onto treatment, and get 90% of them virologically suppressed. Here's a slide from a meta-analysis from CID, Clinical Infectious Disease, uh, from last year, which is showing that in individuals in Africa who are on antiretroviral therapy, if they're lost to care, that's usually a, a pretty bad sign. As you can see with the red circle, um, I want you to focus on that second number. 22% of individuals, 21% um, of individuals, excuse me, who were lost to care uh, were deceased, unfortunately. So, uh, again, the public health aspect of getting individuals linked and retained into care is a critical aspect. So I'll stop here. This is the first quarter of the presentation, and really this is a, a public health talk. Um, HIV is easy to diagnose, um, and now the medications are getting easier to use, and they're getting people virologically suppressed. We've got to do a better job of getting everybody test. At your institution, um, do individuals have to sign for consent, or are they automatically tested when, when they come in? Mm, they have to get consent. I'm, I'm not sure here, but where I came from, we had to get consent. We did, too. I've never yeah. been anywhere that didn't have yeah. consent. We, we were kind of told even to test. If we didn't get consent, we weren't allowed to even. Yeah, that's what we were told. 
I would, um, so since 2012, when I came to Houston, our institution, the consent form when you come to care includes consent for HIV. So when you sign that consent form, when you first are coming to care, you consent to get HIV tested, which allows for universal testing uh, and takes away that barrier. And that's an important barrier because um, we, we, uh, we have a lot of people that were just tested two months ago, four months ago, six months ago, who are, end up turning positive. Um, and there are plenty of studies now coming out that the earlier you get somebody on therapy, the less immune damage is done and the smaller the HIV reservoir, uh, which right now doesn't have an immediate clinical impact, but probably will have a clinical impact in the future. Uh, so, so that's an important institutional change uh, or institutional barrier that could be addressed. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is Life expectancy for an individual with HIV is near normal if they're started on antiretroviral therapy and they re remain on the antiretroviral therapy. So the last study that I saw, there was an approximately two-month decrease lifespan in someone with HIV on their meds versus somebody without. So that's something, it's, it's always the first message that I tell someone when, when they get diagnosed is uh, I want to give them um, I want to let them understand that they can lead a completely normal life uh, and, a, and a full life uh, if they get on their medication and stay on their medication. All right, so to shake things up, um, I, I put some case studies in here just so uh, we can stay interactive. <clears throat> so 64-year-old gentleman with HIV with a high CD4 count who's virologically suppressed and has long-standing viral suppression presents to a rheumatologist with bilateral knee pain that he attributes to working as a carpenter. There's tenderness to palpation over the joint space, um, and then the pain is relieved with an intraarticular injection. Unfortunately, two months later, the patient comes back, says he's exhausted, he's achy, um, and he's thirsty, and he's peeing all the time. So does anyone have any, any idea what happened? So this is probably steroid-induced diabetes. This was a case that I saw of an individual with steroid-induced diabetes. So some of the HIV drugs, uh, in particular the protease inhibitors, require boosting. So the boosting means that we have to give an additional protease inhibitor. The most commonly used one historically was ritonavir, and that would inhibit the, the CYP uh, P450. When the CYP P450 is inhibited, it's going to allow steroids to hang around a lot longer and increase the risk of steroid-induced diabetes. And we've seen steroid-induced diabetes even in the case of inhaled or injected steroids. So not somebody who's put on a prolonged taper um, for a COPD exacerbation, um, but somebody who's getting it inhaled and injected. So if you absolutely need to use a steroid, use one that doesn't interact with a CYP3A as much, um, and better yet, get the individual off of the protease inhibitor or um, the cobacystat. So let's go to the next slide. So in 2019, these are all of the first line regimens that we have. Now the one in red is the first first line, um, and everything else are the ones that are, are alternative first-line therapies. So 90% of people these days are being started on a drug called Bictarvi, which is a combination of Bictegravir, Tenofovir, um, and 3TC. A uh, small number of individuals are started on Triumec, which is a combination of Dalrutegravir, Abacavir, uh, and 3TC. Um, so the drugs that are going to inhibit the P450 are your cobacistat and your darunavir um, and ritonavir. It's rare that we have patients on these medicines anymore because of the metabolic adverse effects of them. They're not very severe. They're still very good drugs, um, but we just don't have the 
metabolic side effects or the drug-drug interactions with people on integrase inhibitors. So if somebody presents to your clinic and you need to give them a steroid, just contact their HIV provider and say, I want to give them a steroid. Can we switch them off of their protease inhibitor? Can we switch them to something that doesn't have drug-drug interactions? This is becoming much less of a problem as everybody is being switched over to integrase inhibitors uh, and switched off of protease inhibitors. But something that should be in the back of your mind, um, whatever app you have on your phone, just check it real quick for drug-drug interactions uh, and you should be fine. The other thing to point out, um, this year we have the first two drug regimens that's FDA approved. Uh, there are some caveats to using this, but uh, a bit of a paradigm shift for HIV care providers to be able to give a, a two drug regimen. This is the same information. I'm just showing you this in pictorial format. Uh, I like to show this to my patients to say, look at this. In 2019, if you'll notice here in this blue column on the top left, these are all the one pill once a day options that we currently have. Uh, the two in red are the ones that are used the most for the reasons that I mentioned to you. Um, down here in the bottom right, it's kind of interesting. You can see these legacy drugs. Uh, really shows you how far we've gotten in HIV, that we have drugs that are, are rarely used anymore. Some of them, like trisavir, right here is rarely used because it didn't work very well. It didn't get viral suppression as well as others. Others like Kaletra, um, this is a very uh, common drug, very robust drug, but when you're on it for decades, it would lead to metabolic adverse effects, and that's why we don't use it anymore. Um, others, these are the drugs that, right, so um, IDV, let's see, DDI, uh, and somewhere, D4T, these are the drugs that used to cause pancreatitis. We don't use these for side effects anymore. None of the common drugs that we use currently um, increase your risk for pancreatitis. So for the most part, these drugs have uh, been retired because of better safety pro profile of newer drugs. All right, another case. 23-year-old comes in after a uh, motor vehicle crash. Um, in the ER, opt-out testing, diagnosis HIV. He's referred to your clinic. CD4 count of 500, viral load 39,000. CBC and CMP are normal. The rest of the social exam and the physical exam are all normal. So when should he be started on antiretroviral therapy? His CD4 count's pretty high. What do people think here? Start now. Yeah. If he's not so, having an active infection, that you would be concerned for iris. Great. So, in general, the rule of thumb, as soon as the patient says they want to start, and as soon as you can get them ready to understand the importance of starting, you want to start them. The other important thing is make sure that they have a continuous supply of antiretroviral therapy. The therapy is expensive, but if you live in a major city that has a, uh, a good Ryan White funded HIV clinic, there are plenty of different pathways to get patients covered. Um, and good clinics are really run by good case managers and social, uh, social workers who know all of the different payment plans. I tell my patients, no matter how little or how money, much money you make, we'll find a way to get your meds paid for. You might just have to work with the case managers a little bit longer. But once we get that continuous supply of antiretroviral therapy for the patients, you want to start them as soon as you can. And the reasons are listed here. We spoke about the decreased transmission from the HPTN052 study. Um, uh, starting with CD4 counts greater than 500 has also been shown to decrease mortality. Now, this study was done in West Africa, and most of the mortality was due to decreased TB that occurred in people with CD4 counts greater than 500, but we still apply it that, in general, there's decreased mortality even at CD4, high CD4 counts. There's an old study, the SMART trial, that's a, about a decade old, that also showed that being on antiretroviral therapy, even if you had uh, elevated CD4 counts, was beneficial in terms of decreasing coronary artery disease, stroke, uh, and renal impairment. Finally, there's decreased risk of cancer, even at high CD4 counts for DQs, K KS, uh, and lymphoma. So the answer is, as soon as you can get the patient to put the medicine in their mouth every single day, you want to get them started. 
All right, so 32-year-old presents with fever, cough, weight loss. The individual is diagnosed with TB and HIV. The CT scan shows very uh, faint miliary disease with some hilar lymphadenopathy. Um, Anti-tuberculosis therapy is started. Four weeks later, the patient's feeling better. Antiretroviral therapy is started. Three weeks after that, the patient reports an increase in symptoms. So fever, chills, cough, and new hemoptysis. So what happened here? I heard someone mention iris earlier. Iris, yeah, iris. Yeah, so this is TB iris, and TB is a pretty classic one to, to develop iris. You can develop either paradoxical iris, which is what this case was. We knew the person had TB. We started them on therapy, they got better, and then they got worse, a paradoxical um, iris. Uh, there's also unmasking iris where someone comes in, they're asymptomatic, we start them on their antiretroviral therapy, and then, then two to two weeks to two months later, they, they have um, new symptoms of TB. The TB was probably there all the time. Um, uh, but the improved immune system unmasks those symptoms. So there are plenty of studies that have looked at this. When should we start people on antiretroviral therapy in the setting of a certain co-infection? In general, and I'll tell you the exceptions coming up, but in general, early antiretroviral therapy improves mortality, but is associated with increased morbidity. So usually what we tell patients is, especially if your CD4 count is less than 50, okay, there's a chance you could have a detrimental immune reconstitution. There's a chance that we're going to do exactly what we want, we're going to wake up your immune system, but you're going to have an increase in symptoms. We'll get you through that increase in symptoms. You just have to stay on your meds, tell us what symptoms you have. And, and in general, for people with CD4 counts that are lower than 50, there's up to a 33% chance that they'll develop iris, depending on the study that, that was looked at. All right, another case. 27-year-old female diagnosed with, anti, with HIV, started on antiretroviral therapy. Four months later, develops diarrhea, palpitations, alopecia, exophthalmos, thyromegaly. The TSH is undetectable, and the thyroid ultrasound shows diffuse glandular enlargement. Does anyone want to guess what happened here? Yeah, so iris can present with autoimmune diseases. Um, so it's much less rare than iris related to TB or iris related to pneumocystis, but um, the literature has reports of TTP, Graves' disease, um, sarcoid, vitiligo, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and psoriasis, uh, all worsening before getting better immediately after somebody was started on their antiretroviral therapy. Um, so sometimes uh, autoimmune disease will be how someone's iris presents. Just uh, be aware. Usually you can treat them through this very easily uh, uh, with immunosuppressants, and you treat it very similar to uh, somebody without HIV. And usually, unless it's life-threatening, we keep them on their antiretroviral therapy. All right, 18-year-old male, advanced AIDS, presents with three weeks of headache, one week of fevers. The opening pressure is 32, and the CSF cryptococcal antigen is positive. Does anyone have any idea on when we start antiretroviral therapy in this case? Not right away. So this is the one exception, is meningitis. So for cryptococcal meningitis or for TB, if they develop iris, the iris can be fatal because obviously increases in opening pressure, increases in inflammation in the closed space of the brain um, can be extremely detrimental uh, and, and fatal. So this is the one case where we have good evidence where you'll delay antiretroviral therapy. Um, uh, and, and in general, we base this recommendation off of a study that was done in Uganda that delayed therapy for six weeks. Most individuals in the U.S. will start someone on antiretroviral therapy between four and six weeks 
depending on the clinical course. So this is meningitis, both the cryptococcal meningitis or TB are the one uh, exception to the rule that early antiretroviral therapy early is beneficial. All right, 18 year old female has fevers, sore throat, pancytopenia, and is presenting in septic shock. Her HIV screen is negative, but an HIV viral load uh, is greater than 10 to the 7. So that's a, consistent with acute HIV. Labs show a transaminitis, the hemoglobin is 5, platelets are 18, and the ferritin is greater than 20,000. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. So acute HIV um, is one of the precipitating factors of, of HLH. Um, so in general, HIV will present with a sore throat and a mono-like illness. Uh, we keep in, um, improving our, our HIV diagnostic tests. So this window, the window period is when the ELISA, the antibody screen is negative, but the viral load is positive. That window currently has been eliminated down to a two-week window. So the fourth generation HIV tests will detect the P24 antigen as early as two weeks. Um, but we do every once in a while get individuals who present extremely sick. Um, uh, we have one currently in the hospital who had um, acute hepatitis B and acute HIV who presented with HLH that's being uh, uh, managed right now. Um, early antiretroviral therapy is critical for these individuals and then getting the HEMONC team on board um, to help with etoposide and, and steroids is helpful. All right, 65-year-old white man is diagnosed with HIV, started on Triumec. Ten days later, he presents with cough, ground glass chest x-ray, nausea, fever, eosinophilia, and the dis dis disclamative rash shown in some of these pictures here. The individual is HLA B5701 positive. Does anyone know what's going on here? A back of ear. This is a classic case of a back of ear hypersensitivity. Um, I have not seen a case since 2006 because in 2006, a New England Journal came out tying the abacavir-induced hypersensitivity to HLA B5701. We don't see this anymore because everybody um, who started on abacavir is screened beforehand. Um, or I haven't seen a case, and there hasn't been one presented at our local uh, ID conference, at least in, in uh, since 2006 that I recall. Um, so this sounds like everyone there is familiar with this. It, it presents um, like SJS or T TEN. Um, you never want to re-challenge an individual because it's potentially uh, fatal. Um, and then just remembering that you, you've got to check an HLA B5701 before starting somebody um, is critical. Uh, this, for a couple of years, Triumec, which contains a Bacavir, was one of the most commonly used antiretroviral therapies. There's a new one called um, Bictarvi, which uh, is surpassing Triumec. Uh, so I think we'll see this even less. There is a uh, Indian generic pharmaceutical company that is producing um, a Dalrotegravir with Tenofovir for the African subcontinent. So it will not be seen over there uh, as well. Uh, because they're just excluding a back of ear from most antiretroviral regimens. All right, so a lot of our HIV patients uh, uh, require Bactrim for PJP prophylaxis. Um, while the general population has approximately 10% uh, allergic reactions to Bactrim, this increases to greater than 50% in individuals with HIV AIDS. Um, this is an immune-mediated reaction uh, it can be very mild. Um, <laughs> we have someone currently in the hospital who just has protracted hiccups every time he gets back drum, so we had to use a tovacorn. Um, but it can be very severe as well. Um, if it is severe and you need to use uh, uh, back drum, um, there are ways to desensitize people. 
Um, I can say honestly, I've never had to do this. We usually can come up with a different regimen of uh, clindamycin and primaquine or tovaquone, depending on how ill the person is. Um, uh, but this is something to, to think of and, and to know. Uh, and we don't understand the mechanism. As far as I uh, know, there hasn't been an explanation on why this is increased in individuals with HIV. This is a slide from a few years ago, but I, I keep this slide just to, to prove a point. Um, so, dolvertegravir is one of the most common integrase inhibitors. It's part of the Triumac regimen. Um, darunavir, ritonavir is the most commonly used protease inhibitor combination at this point. Um, and then efavirenz, this is a tripla. Um, this was the most common one pill, once a day regimen. Um, from 2006 to approximately 2012. What I want to show you here is that both of the dolrotegravir regimens, here in blue on the bottom, here in blue on the top, all of the integrase inhibitors are much more likely to have a sharp decline in their HIV viral load. So we used to tell patients somewhere between 6 and 12 months, we expect you to be virologically suppressed. Now we get to tell patients somewhere between one and three months, we expect you to be completely virologically suppressed after you start your antiretroviral therapy. With this, I have not seen a report that there's going to be, that, that we're having increased immune reconstitution due to more rapid um, immune recovery and, and viral suppression. Uh, it's certainly something that's feasible that we are thinking about and watching. So, in our HIV clinic, for individuals that are virologically suppressed, um, our HIV clinic can turn into a primary care clinic where we're managing diabetes, we're managing their cardiovascular risks, because for many of our patients, they've been virologically suppressed for an extended amount of time. One thing that's been noticed is that there's increased rates of allergic rhinitis and reactive airway disease. Uh, there's no current HIV-specific treatment for this. Um, some individuals think that we have to make sure that they're fully virologically suppressed. Uh, a lot of our patient population is smoking both tobacco and marijuana, uh, and helping them with that might help. Um, and just to reiterate the message from earlier, you can get them on inhaled or intranasal steroids if you think that will help, um, but just beware of drug-drug interactions. And again, hopefully that is occurring less and less as we move people um, from more antiquated regimens to more modern regimens. So can HIV patients undergo desensitization? Uh, the answer here is, is absolutely um, yes. There, there's absolutely no contraindication. Um, my recommendation and what I've seen in the literature is make sure they're virologically suppressed first. Um, because uh, as we see with Bactrim-related uh, allergic reactions, that decreases the longer someone is virologically suppressed. But once they're virologically suppressed, um, uh, once the CD4 count is recovered, um, you can safely uh, desensitize uh, patients living with HIV. Uh, when is it safe to vaccinate individuals? Um, if it's an inactive vaccine, do it anytime you want. Um, if, uh, if it's the flu, for example, just give them uh, not the intranasal flu, which has been removed from the market, I think, last year. But for the flu, give it to them every year, irrespective of their CD4 count and viral load. Um, some experts recommend for vaccines that you can delay, to delay until they're virologically suppressed um, and they've reconstituted their immune system. In general, for attenuated live vaccines, you want to wait until their CD4 counts greater than 200 and the viral load is suppressed. Just a reminder, um, these are a list of the live attenuated vaccines um, on the left and the uh, inactivated or, or subunit killed vaccines on the right. 
Uh, for zoster, it's recommended um, to give it uh, once the CD4 count is greater than 200 and the viral load is suppressed. The HPV vaccine uh, is a critical one to give to everybody. Um, in this population, we see a lot of uh, urogenital dysplasia. And that urogenital dysplasia and increased cancer risk um, is decreased uh, drastically with the vaccine. Uh, so it's critical to, to make sure all of these patients are getting HPV vaccine. If they're in a Ryan White funded clinic, they can get the vaccine irrespective of their age. Um, and that's, that's important because these are high risk groups um, that their cervical dysplasia, their, um, their anal dysplasia um, can progress rapidly. Uh, to overt cancer. Uh, and don't forget, pregnancy is not a contraindication to the flu vaccine. Um, we vaccinate all of our pregnant women um, with and without HIV. AIDS Info is a great website. Um, it's a government-run website that is continuously up updated with new information. Um, uh, I frequently pull this up to, to check for um, for my live vaccines to, to make sure I'm giving them at the correct time. Uh, it's a great resource uh, to pull up. And here's a slide uh, that I wanted to share because I think it's going to be a game changer for a select group of patients that are having trouble taking uh, oral therapy for HIV. So. This is not FDA approved yet, but it's over two years since we've had the success of a phase two study. So this is intramuscular long-acting cabotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, with ropivirine, which is an NNRTI inhibitor. So what happens with, with these studies um, is they get the oral version. This gray part is they're getting the oral drug, cabotegravir, um, plus a bacrovir lamivudine to get them undetectable. Once they are undetectable, they are then switched either to intramuscular uh, cabotegravir ropivirine for every eight weeks or every four weeks, or they stay on the same drug, uh, an oral version of the drug. Um, so what you can see here is that the intramuscular injection uh, was statistically significant, uh, non-inferior, excuse me, um, to the oral regimen. So for our individuals with severe mental health, with housing insecurity, um, with substance use, uh, who have trouble remembering to take a medicine every day, uh, a lot of us are hoping that this once a month, once every two month uh, regimen uh, will give us a benefit for these individuals. So that's it. I have a list of take-home points and learning uh, points right here um, that you guys can review later. Uh, are there any questions? I have a quick uh -huh. question. Um, in patients who have a uh, undetectable viral load, when you're counseling them on transmission, do you do they still have to disclose to their partner that they have HIV if they can't transmit the disease? Disclosure is um, disclosures are, are a personal topic. Um, I don't know the legal ramifications of disclosing or not disclosing once you're virologically suppressed. I can't answer that. It, it, it is very challenging for us um, to work with family members and knowing the right time that disclosure would be beneficial and when disclosure might be detrimental. We offer case managers and social workers. I hope I got across the point that successful HIV care in 2019 uh, is critical to have both the MDs, uh, the clinicians, and the, the ancillary staff working together to address these issues. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a direct answer to you for that from the, the legal ramifications. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think we're getting into a legal political realm with this one. Yeah, so just a, just a comment and a question. Uh, Jay Portnoy here. 
Uh, I was trained in the early 1980s when this disease was first discovered, and it was universally a fatal uh, disease. It was a death sentence. You died quickly. There was no treatment that was effective. When the first uh, protease inhibitors came out, it was considered a miracle, but you had to take it every, like, four hours or something, and terrible side effects. It was it was terrible. And so hearing this information, it's it's a game changer. It's it's like, are you talking about the same disease? It, it, it's like a, it's just a chronic disease like any other chronic illness mm -hmm. that we treat now, and that's I never dreamed that that would be the, the case. So th this is absolutely miraculous from my perspective. But my question is, uh, are we close to a cure where we can just, you know, actually get rid of it and then they don't have to keep getting the treatment? How, how far away is the, is the cure for HIV? I'm going to tackle that in three different steps. Um, one, uh, to reiterate what you said about how much it has changed. The magic year historically is 1995 where we found out that combination of highly active antiretrovirals um, changed people's lives and prevented uh, the universal mortality that we had. Um, and we had the so-called Lazarus effect about people coming back from the dead. Um, uh, unfortunately, the stigma related to HIV AIDS still persists, which is why I now start my conversation with people when I'm telling them they have HIV, that people with HIV, if they take their medicine every single day, uh, will live a normal life expectancy, near normal life expectancy, um, with only one pill a day, which, which is very different from the mid-90s when we had to take 21 pills in a day often. Um, the second part about the question about a cure, uh, we have a cure right now. Um, unfortunately, that cure requires you to take one pill once a day for the rest of your life, but I would argue that's a lot easier than managing diabetes where you have to check your blood sugar, you have to actually use part of your brain to decide um, how much insulin to give yourself, you've got to watch your diet. You don't have to watch your diet at all um, with HIV other than for the fact that, you know, like any other person, you're at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, so I, I, I take a little bit of offense when the, the news cycles come up for the Berlin patient or the London patient because we have a cure right now. Um, it just requires a little bit of work of patients taking their meds every day. The bigger question which you're asking is when, do we, when are we going to have a cure where people don't have to take their meds? There's many pathways towards that. Um, uh, I, I last reviewed that topic around a year ago, and there's a, there are people who are working on interferon alpha, Pegasus, um, in order to boost the immune system after keeping people suppressed for a long time. People were using talons and, and, uh, and zinc finger nucleases, and now you're using CRISPRs to try and think about how this would be feasible. Uh, and then I hope everybody in the audience has heard about the Berlin and the London patients which unfortunately were individuals which developed AML. They went through multiple bone marrow transplants um, and they were transplanted with a CCR5 um, uh, resistant uh, 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 transplant um, and therefore they were able to come off of their medicine, their antiretrovirals because their cells couldn't be infected with, with HIV because of the CCR5 um, single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, unfortunately, as, as, as this audience knows, I mean, a bone marrow transplant comes with approximately 20 to 35 percent mortality, and that's just not a feasible way for a cure as of right now. And the CRISPR technology has way too many off-target um, uh, effects uh, right now. But people are spending their careers looking for that. So I, I think it's feasible in the next five or 20 years that we do have a cure that patients can come off of their medicines. But right now I would highlight the point um, that you already highlighted, which is that this is an easy disease to treat if people put the pills in their mouth once a day and, and they have an effective cure at that point. And one, one other comment, um, this is a disease that's been a terrible 
affliction to ma mankind, and you know the, the miraculous, not, notwithstanding the miracles in terms of the treatment. The other thing, the, 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 I guess there is a silver lining to this cloud. Look at how much we have learned about how the immune system works mm -hmm. and about how to modify it just by being motivated to study and try to conquer this disease. It is it has resulted in new technologies and new knowledge of the immune system that I would posit might not have been available to us had this disease not occurred. What do you think of that? I think it's a good point, and it's uh, an interesting silver lining that we always um, that we always look for for those silver linings, and we need our our leaders to set aside money. Um, to, to for this research, 100% agree. This disease forced that to occur because the reality is there will be another HIV-like disease mm -hmm. sometime in, in the future. I don't know when or how it will manifest, but it will inevitably occur. And now we have new tools uh, have been developed that would allow us to maybe address those, that new disease, whatever it, it is. And, and so that, that's a silver lining. Mm -hmm. I think so. I agree. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, hopefully my, oh, you know what? I'll share my email um, and people are happy to reach out and hopefully you guys can um, uh, meet some of the local care providers there um, because it's good to have uh, communication with them, um, especially if you do have to give them steroids or, or other drugs that you're concerned about drug-drug interactions. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was it was really great. My pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.